trying to reconnect. Okay, go. Good morning and welcome to this week's Sunday worship service at Wetumpka First Baptist Church. We're happy to have the Williamsons back with us this Sunday, and we're also looking forward to Brother Stephen Little's message this morning. This is the fifth Sunday we have live streamed our service since the COVID-19 pandemic started. And we have been overtaken, some of us have, by fear and uncertainty during this time. Families, friends, and congregations have been separated. It's a confusing and frightening time. But it, as Christians, we can find comfort through our faith and through God's Word. I'd like to share verses 9 through 16 of Psalms 91 with you this morning. And it, while you find that, Psalms 91, verse 9 through 16, I'm reminded of a great American who once said, My religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as I do in bed. God has fixed a time for my death. I do not concern myself with that, but to be always ready, no matter when it may overtake me. This is the way all men should live, and then all men will be equally brave. Psalms 91, verse 9. For you, the Lord, is a safe retreat. You have made the most high your refuge. No disaster shall befall you. No calamity shall come upon your home. For he has charged his angels to guard you wherever you go, to lift you on their hands, for fear that you should strike your foot against a stone. You shall step on an asp and cobra, you shall tread safely on snake and serpent. Because his love is set on me, I will deliver him. I will lift him beyond danger, for he knows me by my name. When he calls upon me, I will answer. I will be with him in time of trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to, to honor. I will satisfy him with long life to enjoy the fullness of my salvation. At this time, we shall pray. For all those, for all whose day starts with anxiety, as they leave the security of their home, worrying about the risk of infection, particularly those whose health or age classifies them as vulnerable, loving God, be close, keep them safe, along with all whose tasks today include the care of the frail and elderly. And for all of us, grant wisdom to make sensible choices, not just for ourselves, but for everybody. At this time, I'd like you to join me in singing hymn 333, Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the ever. 
everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near me. Sue Lyles have a birthday this week. Uh, oh. So, in celebration of that, I'd like you all to join me in singing happy birthday to Joy and Sue. And I just realized we didn't have any background music for that. <laughs> you got it right here. Oh, here we go. Donnie's going to help us out. today. Please continue to support the church with your tithes and offerings and the Annie Armstrong Mission Fund. Your tithes and offerings once again may be sent to the Wetumpka First Baptist Church at P.O. Box 156, Wetumpka, Oklahoma, 74883. And we also have, I've been made aware that we have an online giving platform through the Baptist Foundation at www.bfok.org slash give dash FBC Wetumpka. The tithe will be sent directly to our church through this platform. And please continue supporting the Williamsons at www.williamsonsmusic.com. And during the week, please check back regularly on our Facebook page for any updates and announcements. At this time, I'd like to uh, welcome the Williamsons to do a few songs for us. And about the time, we, we have been, I'll explain something real quick. You forgot the other microphone at the other church. <laughs> nah, look in that bag right there and see if it's in there, Sadie. We, um, we've, been helping, we've been helping down at the Methodist Church and running down here. Before that's over, Donna, uh, the girls and I have run down here to get this all set up to help here at the First Baptist Church. And so, yay, we do have it. And I was like, what in the world are we going to do? Yeah, go ahead. Let's sing this old song together. Jesus. Mm. Oh. It says to me, he's so wonderful. To me. 
Christ has shed for our sin. I bet we'll probably hear something about that here in just a minute when Brother Little brings the message. And, and I know uh, old preacher taught me a long time ago. He said, uh, uh, practice I've tried to follow ever since. He said anytime he starts making sermon notes, he gets his blank paper and goes to the last sheet and draws a cross at the bottom of it. So no matter what you're preaching about, it's going to come back to the cross in one way or another. We love singing about that. And I'll tell you something else I love singing about, Lisa, is the faithfulness of God. And haven't we seen that during this time? I mean, we're all still here. We're all still surviving. And who would have thought we could have shut down for a month and, and everybody still uh, have life that's certainly not normal, but we can still see the faithfulness of God. Here's an old, old hymn of the church called Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changest not Thy compassion. You guys hear me in here? Okay. Am I on? All right. I know I'm on here. You guys can see. So, um, good morning. It's good to be back with you guys again this morning. Um, we made a proper adjustment that was very necessary for myself, which is there's a little pin that you cannot see. I'm going to show it to you. Right here. <laughs> that I did not have last week. So I had to, felt like someone had my arm up behind my back because. When I, when I preach, i got to get in there and get onto that thing and grab hold. And last week I was like, I don't know what to do with my hand because every time I touch this thing it was just like sinking down. So I'm, I'm good to go this week. Um, so before we get started, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Lord, I ask that you would 
fill this place with your Holy Spirit. I ask that you would fill the spaces that those that are gathering with us and those who will gather with us um, on Facebook and YouTube and wherever else this will be seen, that you would be among your people in your fullness, that as they listen to your words this morning, Lord, not mine, that they would connect with you, that you would fill us be in us and among us as we go through these, these strange times that we're in. It's in your precious son's name that I pray. Amen. They've got me on a face mic this morning. These things make me a little nervous because the second time I preached with a face mic, I broke it while I was trying to get it on my ear. So um, it's on and hopefully it's going to stay on and not going to fall off in the middle of this. So. Um, so I want to share with you this morning um, something that I think many of us, and I know that I was definitely convicted this week, um, miss in our spiritual lives, Spe specifically in our daily spiritual lives. But um, it's something that um, all of us began um, in our relationship with Christ doing um, it's, it's something that I think maybe some of us don't even realize that we needed to continue doing. Maybe we thought it was something that we only needed to do when Christ saved us. Uh, some of us might even go, well, that's just something only Catholics do. So have you figured out what it is yet? It's confession and repentance. So I, I like the way the Puritans put it. Confession is the language of repentance. Let me say that again. Confession is the language of repentance. So, so what is repentance? So Oxford's Bible Dictionary says, in some really big fancy words, that repentance is the acknowledgement and condemnation of one's own sins, coupled with with a turning to God. True repentance springs from love of God, which human sin rejects or often offends. It includes sorrow for sin committed, confession of guilt, and the purpose of amendment. I actually like the way that John Piper puts it, much simpler and much more eloquently. Repenting means experiencing a change of mind that now sees God as true and beautiful and worthy of all of our praise and all our obedience. A repentant person fully relies on God to do something that they can't do. See, we, we can't atone for our own sin. Repenting is to, to acknowledge that there is something that is wrong in us, that there is something that has separated us from God. And in recognizing that, in repenting, we acknowledge that Jesus has done something on our behalf. And that thing is, it's a fancy Christian word that we use called justification. And it, it just means that he has made us holy and it's not something that we have done. We have been justified before God. So this is something that Christ did. We talked about this last week. This is what Christ did on the cross for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. So I've got a little story that I'll tell you. It doesn't explain justification but it definitely explains the need that we have to recognize that there is nothing that we can do to, in repentance, understand, and we'll talk about this a little bit too, but repentance does not, is not how we receive salvation. 
We repent because we've been forgiven. So, a long time ago when I was in, in youth group, my youth pastor, Jason Wilson, used to take us on these things called, uh, like, mystery trips. And your parents would sign off on where we were going. And you'd just get in the van and you'd just go. And you had no idea where you were going. Well, we went to one of my, still is, one of my favorite places in Oklahoma, uh, Robbers Cave State Park. Hands down, one of the most beautiful places you can visit in Oklahoma. If you have never been there when this is all over and you are able to go, I suggest that you go. Um, if you've ever been and you've ever been to Robbers Cave, there is a, uh, the cave is not cave like in the ground. It's a cave up on kind of a mountainside. Well, as you're going up through there, um, there's these steps. And there's kind of this, this room that's lower and below um, where the cave is. So we were up on top, and I came around, and I looked down in this hole where this room is. And it's probably got 30, 40 foot ceilings, maybe, maybe 50 foot. It's big. And there's a kind of a big boulder in the center of it. And the way that these rocks all interconnect, there's this spot where there's this enormous, enormous rock where there's this point of the rock that jams into the other one. And there's a hole there. And you can see down into this room. Now, I should have known because I had been in the room underneath and looked up, which is a much better perspective to have than looking down on something. Distance looks a lot different when you're looking down on something versus looking up at something. And so my young self, probably 15, 16 years old, I thought, because I love to climb, that I could get down into this hole and I'd be able to put my arm around this rock and I'd shimmy down in there. And I thought I'd be able to just kind of push off this rock and land on this large boulder that was down in the center of this room. And that would be really fun and super cool to do and show all my friends how neat and cool I was. Well, let me just tell you, that boulder that was below that hole was about 20 feet down. It looked like it was about maybe 10. I'm thinking, if it's 10 feet and I'm hanging off, that's only five or six more feet. I've jumped off five or six foot boulders before. That's no big deal. So I get down inside this hole. I've got my arm wrapped around it. And I start to look down and realize I'm in a pickle. And I cannot get out. And I had a friend with me. And I, I said, um, can you give me your hand? Now, here's the problem. I climbed in this way through the hole. I've got my right arm like this. My left arm is free. The hole's over here. So I cannot get my other arm across the only arm that I can hold with. I can't switch arms. There's not a place to put my arm to switch so that I can take a hand. And I said, I need you to go get help right now. Like, right now. So she takes off running. And we're, this is a big open place. Except if you've never been there, there's a lot of area there. Okay? So she goes off hollering trying to find Jason, my youth pastor. I'm hanging here by myself with my arm like this, and it begins to shake. And this is one of those situations that you realize that you, you don't have a choice but to hang on. There, there is no option. And I, I'm in the moment, I'm not panicking as much as I can because I don't want to lose strength. And so I'm focused on everything I can do to reduce my weight and hold myself and wait wait until my youth pastor gets there, hoping that he will be able to have enough strength to help me get myself back out of this pickle that I have put myself into. So I don't remember how long it was, but it felt like eternity before he got there. And when he got there, I thought my arm, I mean, my arm was violently shaking because I could not hold my body weight. And listen, y'all, I've been putting on the corona or the, you know, the quarantine 15 like everybody else, but I was skinny back then. I mean, I weigh like a buck thirty. It, it wasn't much, and so I, I can't even imagine holding on that way now. So he finally gets there. He reaches in there, and we figure something out. And he grabs my arm, and he goes, "You're gonna have to let go because I can't reach your left arm, and if you do, your whole weight's gonna shift." 
If I'm holding like this and I reach across and grab and I let go, I'm going to swing and he's going to have to hold a whole lot more weight than just me. But if he can just grab my arm and I can let go, then he'll be able to help me shuffle my way back out. I can get my other hand on the other side and he can pull me out. I do not like this idea because I have to completely let go. And if he does not have my arm, I'm going to fall 20 or 30 feet to the ground. I don't know if you've ever fallen 20 or 30 feet. I have not, but I did not want to find out, nor do I do now. It would have hurt. I can tell you today, the chances of me not being in a wheelchair right now, had I fallen, are pretty slim. Could have been far worse, depending on how I fell. But I didn't fall. Because I trusted my youth pastor. Because he'd been a long time friend. This was not someone that I just had a, 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 a short you know, every Wednesday after relationship, I had a long relationship with him. I knew that he was going to be there to take care of me. I put my faith and my trust in him, and he got me out. Hear me. When we repent, we are acknowledging that Jesus Christ did in the same way what my youth pastor did for me. I let go. And I acknowledge that there was nothing that I could do to get myself out of that situation. Nothing. I put my entire faith and trust in him, knowing that if he does not get me out of this, I have no hope. When we acknowledge and we confess our sin before God, we are reminding ourselves that he is our only hope. And this is something that we continue to to do. See, I think oftentimes we move away from confession and repentance because we go, well, I've been justified. Right? And hear me. Th this is a strange thing. I, I, I don't deny it at all. And again, we, I will touch on this here in a minute because I want to explain it well. But understand, we do not repent so that we can be justified again. If you have been saved, if you are in Christ, if you have the Holy Spirit, then you have been justified once for all time. We don't repent to get that. We repent so that we can continue to live in the reality that we have forgiveness for sins, that we continue to commit. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is present tense. Think about it this way. Again, I said this last week and probably hear me say it a lot. Every analogy breaks down at some point. But just think about it this way. There is a bank account that is full of funds. Okay? And we live in the present. Now, God he looks the other way. He can see it from the other side. But we live in the moment. We live here. And so as we confess our sins, it is like a real life I thought of those funds are being transferred to your account. So that you are continually not in debt before the Lord. That you can continue to stay in a right relationship. I'm not saying it actually happens that way, but this is a way of thinking about it so that we live in the reality of confessing and repenting our sins before the Lord. Revelation 2, 4 through 5 says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Again, this is, I, I just want to bring out this point. This is a present tense thing. Like I said, I think so many of us get caught up and go, we talk about repentance in the church. We talk about repentance. But who do we focus on the need to repent? We go, well, that's for sinners who don't know Jesus. Hear me. Repentance is what marks us. It's what marks us as believers. It's what, how we first cried out. It's, it's, the, it's the, 
on the bottom of the baby when it's first born. That cry, that moment that you were born again, you cried out and confessed that he is Lord, that you have sinned against a holy God, and that he has paid for all of your sins. You acknowledge that you needed him, lest you perish. So, why repentance? Why is repentance so important to our daily life? We've talked a little bit about it, but I I want to point out some specific things. One is that Jesus proclaimed that everyone should repent. In Luke 24, 46-47, it says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day from the dead, and rise, sorry, and, uh, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So this is after the resurrection. Jesus has raised. He finds his disciples in the room and tells them this. Go. Tell everyone. Everyone should repent. He teaches us in the Lord's Prayer. Right? Luke 11, 4. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. When we ask for the forgiveness of sins, that starts through repentance. That starts through the act of confessing the areas that we fall short. See, at conversion, we repented as a response to the gospel, the good news, being brought into a new covenant with Christ. And we continue in repentance because it is an acknowledgement that until he returns, we continue to need his forgiveness in our lives as he conforms us into his image in order that we can continue to walk in obedience. This morning on my drive here, every once in a while you just get those, if you're working on your sermon, sometimes you just get those aha moments or something just strikes your memory as you're thinking back through your notes. And I was struck by um, the, the, the phrase I'm going to look at in here, but I want to read the passage so you hear the whole thing. In Psalms 32, I was like, ah, David. David has said something profound about confession. So, Psalm 32, 1 through 7. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now listen. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely, in the rush of the great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Do you hear it? He said, when I, when I shut my mouth, when I shut inside of me the things that are in me, that are sin that are wicked, that are against the Lord. And hear me, this is not, he's not talking about a conversion experience. This is David as he walks with the Lord. This is a man after the Lord's own heart who says, as I walk with the Lord, when I didn't confess my sin to you, the Lord pressed me, put his hand on me, disciplined me until I confessed. And when I did, he forgave me. David is explaining what happens in how we experience real-time forgiveness through confession. 
is a reminder of our dependence on him. One of the most important parts of being a Christian is understanding how utterly dependent we are on him. At the Last Supper, um, Jesus tells kind of a, he gives an interesting imagery. In John 15, 1 through 7, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. That's what I just talked about. That pruning is that discipline of the Lord. That it may bear more fruit. See, the discipline of the Lord produces more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Hear it. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Luke 3, 8 is, is a quote from John who it hearkens, Jesus is almost hearkening back to what John says. John says, um, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. <clears throat> See, one of the most important things, why I say this is one of the most important things for us as believers is because repentance and confession is the evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's evidence. What did he say? You prove that you are my disciple if you have fruits. Where do fruits come from? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what blossoms those, the, those fruits as we are on the vine. That is connected to Jesus. Romans 8, 7 through 10 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. The Spirit is what gives us life, the ability, the reminder that we must confess the sins that are in our hearts and in our minds to Him. The moment we stop seeing our own sin as serious is the moment that we take our eyes off Jesus. Repentance reminds us that it's only in the shadow of the cross that we see how much his grace costs. Would you think about that for a second? I'm going to read it again. Repentance reminds us that it's only in the shadow of the cross that we see how much his grace costs. See, so often we try to live ahead of repentance, on the other side of repentance. So how do we live as people who are marked by repentance? How do we, as Christians, live a life marked, that's visible to everyone around us, that we have repentant hearts, that we confess our sin before God, so I think the first thing is we walk in confession and repentance in order to experience the full grace of God. You know, I just said that I think we so often try to live on the other side of repentance. So 
we, we focus on, we say, you know, God loves me. When we focus on the grace of God, oh, I'm so grateful, I'm so thankful that I'm saved, I'm so thankful that I have a relationship with him. But what happens is when we, we sin, at least I can tell you this, at least from my personal experience, I have a feeling most of you will resonate with this. You sin, you realize that you sin, in the back of your mind you say to yourself, well, I'm, I know I'm forgiven, so I'm thankful for that. And God's already paid for that, so I'm just going to move forward. Let's kind of act like nothing happened. Let's just move on. And, and, we, and we move forward. And then what happens? We sin again. We do the same thing. And we move on, and we move on, and we move on. And then all of a sudden, it's just my, my terminology, my phrase here. You've got a backlog of confession and repentance to do. I can just tell you, growing up in church, that's what camp was for, right? Like, this is what you did. You sin all year long. You went to false creek, and it's like, oh, you know what? All of a sudden, students would be reminded that they were sinners. Heck, half of them would want to get baptized again, and you no, you're, you're saved, or, or you wouldn't be standing here in front of me telling you that you, you're a sinner. You, you know that you, 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 you have a relationship with Jesus, and you get to talk them out of it. Why? Because they didn't look at their sin all year long. They didn't look in that mirror of the cross and be reminded that they were not walking in step with the Spirit. And that, that I'm not saying that meaning like walking in step meaning without sin. When you walk in step with the Spirit, brother and sister, when you walk in step with the Spirit, it means as you sin, you confess before the Lord. Why? Because when you ignore your sin, you're, you're not acknowledging the need of a Savior. And you didn't just need Jesus the day that you realized that you had sin. You need him every day till he returns. See, we cheapen the grace of God. When we skip over that, we cheapen the grace of God when we act like there is no need to acknowledge our sin. Simply because it's been forgiven. When in fact, our sins being forgiven is exactly why we need to acknowledge it. I'll harken back to the, to the probably a poor analogy that I used a minute ago with the bank account. See, I have a personal relationship with the person who owns the bank. Wouldn't it be shameful for me not to acknowledge as that person transfers money into my account, as I continue to go into debt, as I sin, to not acknowledge my gratefulness and my thankfulness for that? But see, we often do that part. Well, say, oh, thank you for forgiving me of my sins. But I can tell you, there's something unique when you confess what the sin is. There's something unique that occurs. So the second thing of how we can live marked by repentance is that we see our sins as an opportunity to be reminded that we should forgive as we have been forgiven. This is what we see in the Lord's Prayer. In fact, Jesus says something really scary to me about forgiving others. He says, forgive others or my Father will not forgive you. That's scary to me. I don't, I don't know if it's scary to you guys, but that's a little scary to me. Because I can tell you, this is, these are the places where I'm like, this is a point I would skip over. You won't you can probably guess why I might skip over this. Because I struggle with it. Like many of you. I mean, is there not someone that you could name in your life right now that you have either recently struggled to forgive or currently struggle to forgive? This hit me, and I, and I can't share with you the, the, the reason why, but recently this hit me so hard in a struggle that I've been struggling with to forgive someone. 
And the Lord brought to my mind the darkness of my own sin throughout my time as a Christian. And he goes, I forgave you for that. You can't forgive this person for this. What you did was far darker, far more wicked than that. And yet, you can't offer them the same thing that I've offered to you. It just shook me. I'm not telling you that that moment made it easy to forgive. Or that I don't still sometimes struggle to remind myself that, that I have forgiven that person. But if we are to receive forgiveness, hear me, when we confess our sin, it is a reminder of some, for many of us, how dark sometimes it is in our flesh. How much our flesh still wages war against the spirit that is inside of us. That has given us power over sin. When we confess that to the Lord, something happens in us. We feel a release. We feel forgiven. Despite the fact that we've already been forgiven, we, we feel a tangible, sometimes emotive response to that forgiveness. So the last thing, how we can live marked by repentance. We call others to repentance and belief in Christ. Because we know that he is able to save. So as we confess, see what's interesting is, is that when you don't confess your sin before the Lord, you suddenly begin to get prideful. You suddenly begin to start thinking that somehow you have less sin than all of these other people and that you're somehow deserving of the cross. And then you cease to offer what the cross bought to everyone else. Because you think that you belong on the inside and that maybe they don't. But what happens in us, right? What happens when suddenly you're on your knees or your hands are in your face and there's tears coming down your face and you're beginning to say, I confess this. I confess, Lord, this. I confess. And then you realize, I've been confessing sin for a minute, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. Then suddenly you go, if all of these things were things I confess that were only that it only happened this week, imagine how much I've done that I can't even re- I haven't even realized that I've done that my Father has forgiven me in the cross of Jesus Christ. And suddenly you go, wouldn't I want to offer this to everyone else? Truly, he's mighty to save. When we practice these first two, when we practice walking in confession and repentance to experience the full grace of God, when we forgive others as we've been forgiven, this is what shapes this last one. This is what fills into that bucket that you want to then turn and offer to other people and go, turn, repent, believe. He is faithful because now you are humble. And when you are humble, you want to offer other people the same grace that you've been given. Grace, something you didn't earn and something that you don't deserve. I practiced this for myself yesterday evening. Drove over to OBU finished up my sermon prep. Before I finished that, I sat there, quiet, beautiful evening, and I practiced this, this form of prayer. And I know there's probably, you go out to look for guides, you can find probably a thousand different things throughout history of ways that you can confess. I'm just going to tell you how I did it. I started with, Lord, I confess, and then I fill in the blank. And I started with the obvious things. All of you have obvious things. All of us have obvious things. Start there and begin to let it go deeper. 
and you can no longer get deeper. Until suddenly you find yourself in a place where you, hear me, you call out in worship because you are so grateful that he has been just, hear me, to forgive us our sins. There's this, I could go on here, this is for free, this isn't in my notes. The reason why I think almost all of us don't practice this on a regular basis is because we somehow, because of what the world tells us, that if we focus on the things that are wrong in us, that we'll have a bad self-esteem. That if we focus on the things in us that aren't good, that we'll beat ourselves up. Let me, let me just clear that up real simply. You're not good. I'm not good. There is nothing good in us apart from him. What you are doing is confessing. You're doing what John the Baptist says, well, I must become lesser so that he can become greater. When we confess our sin, we're saying, yeah, I'm messed up. I acknowledge that before you, Lord. And we don't try to sweep it under the rug or hide it under the couch or stuff it under the pillows in our heart. We confess. And hear me, don't, don't do that lie where you go, well, he already knows it anyway. The confession isn't for him to know. He already knows. The confession is for you. The confession is for you. The confession is the acknowledgement that you need him. Not to tell him something that he doesn't already know. Of course he knows. He was there. He watched. You confess because you're acknowledging to him that you're aware. And even to confess and ask him to forgive you for the things that you did unaware, which I promise you probably equal or are greater than the things that you are aware of. And as you confess them, I promise you what will happen is as those things begin to try to come out of you again, the Spirit will bring them to your mind and go, you confess this. Don't walk in it. Don't walk in it. You have the power through me, through the Holy Spirit, to make a choice right now not to act this way, not to make that choice, to show love, and not anger. Whatever it is, walk with him in confession and repentance. If you want to experience the full grace, mercy, and peace of God, then walk with him in confession and repentance. Thank you. I, I challenge all of you, both here and in there, to, to try what I tried last night. Find yourself alone with the Lord and say, I confess. And fill in the blank and see where you find yourself. And end in praise before a holy God that has been good and faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you have called us to be the people that acknowledge our need of you. And I pray that you would make this true in all of our hearts, that when we notice a strain, when we notice a, why am I not experiencing the closeness that I felt with him, or, or, or where has he gone, that oftentimes we find him most when we confess, when we repent and turn from our sin, reminding us that we need Him all the time. One of my favorite hymns, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one confess, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. 
This is often my prayer, Lord. You know that. I pray that it be the prayer of your people. That as we confess, that we would acknowledge our need of you. Not at some single solitary moment when you made us aware of our sins and brought us from death into life and made us new, but that that would be the confession of our heart and our life for all of the time that we have left on this earth until we return or until we go to be with you. For you are good. You are faithful to save. It is in your son's name we pray these things. Amen. You are dismissed.